so I am presenting about uh, don't be so brutal about it. So candy making um, and there's a, you know, with the holidays coming around, a lot of people want to make their own homemade candy. So hopefully you'll learn some tips and tricks today um, about making your own candy as well. Um, so I think I gave a poll to Serene uh, to ask a question here. Um, you know, what will you learn today? Um, and so we're going to just look at the different types of candy, the do's and don'ts of making candy. And then I also have a couple of videos that are pre-recorded for you all um, that we're going to watch about um, how to calibrate a, can a candy thermometer as well as how to make peanut brittle. Um, so that's why this uh, is called Don't Be So Brittle About It. So it's looking like a majority of you all have made homemade candy before. Um, Maybe some unsures there as well. So awesome. So we got, and we got a few newbies as well um, that has not made candy before. So um, let's see. All right. So, um, you know, thinking about candy, there are um, specific ingredients that a majority of candy will have. And so we're going to look at what the purposes are of some of those ingredients. So, of course, sugar is one of the main ingredients. Um, it's typically there for taste, uh, texture, color, also the yield and longevity of the candy. Um, if there's butter asked in it, it's typically added in the final stages and helps um, to prevent large crystal formations, creating a smooth product and also giving it some of that flavor as well. Water um, is another thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about water and how that can affect your candy, but it helps prevent the sugar from burning um, on the bottom of your pan. However, too much or too little water can cause the candy to not set properly. So as water decreases, it can cause those soft and chewy candies to become harder, uh, and too much water can actually cause your hard candy candies to become more sticky and uh, lose flavor. Whereas those glass type of uh, confections can become rubbery if the water is not um, right. Salt is another thing as well. So this helps to stabilize the mixture and it actually keeps it from foaming up too much. And then baking soda, um, which is normally used in your brittles, uh, helps neutralize the acidity of the candy and also helps make it airy. It does um, help create the carbon dioxide in the candy to create air bubbles um, that you see in, in a lot of that candy that calls for baking soda as well. And then of course, flavor, flavoring oils um, is one of the last ones. It, it gives it its specific flavors, but be mindful that there are hot oils out there um, that can burn you. So an example is cinnamon oil. So be very careful uh, when you are handling those flavoring oils, especially if they are um, hot ones as well. Um, with that, Elizabeth, I don't want to cut you off as you're talking about all of the science behind my favorite part, which is the sweet part. But yeah. are you okay if I launch a quick poll to see who, I know that you asked about who had made candy before, but I did want to ask, you know, who has attended an extension workshop before you've been in the get the dish series. Um, so there's yeah, just definitely. four quick questions and I'm sorry about that, Elizabeth. I'm just a little <laughs> bit of brain fog today. So <laughs> apologize. That's okay. That's okay. It's the holiday season setting in. <laughs> I'm just too excited for the brittle today. I'm not going to lie. So <laughs> we'll just okay. give it a few more seconds. If individuals joining wouldn't mind answering that question you know if you've ever attended extension classes before if you've ever attended our get the dish series and um, we have a lot of new people I'm seeing some of those responses so it's so great that people in the room here they're here for the brittle so yes they're here, here to learn about candy yes <laughs> candy brings a lot of people together <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and end that poll thank you Elizabeth Oh, you're welcome. All right, so there are different types of candies uh, that we have out there. And so the two main types of candies are the crystalline and the non-crystalline uh, types of candy. So with the crystalline uh, type of candies, those sugar crystallizes and the smooth texture is typically creamy and smooth. So when you eat it, you actually shouldn't feel the sugar crystals on your tongue. So some good examples of those are like fudge and divinity and fondant. 
Whereas your non-crystalline uh, type of candies, uh, typically your prep work is designed to prevent that crystallization um, and your texture is hard or chewy. Uh, some examples of those are like your caramels, your peanut brittles, your toffees, and then um, also your taffies um, are part of that as well. So peanut brittle typically is cooked to a very high temperature. Adding baking soda causes a less bitter product and it gives it that porous texture and easier to eat. And so there's different types of brittles out there. If you're not a fan of peanuts, there's pecan, there's walnuts, there's cashew brittles. Um, I've seen people put in like, um, um, like peppers and things like that into their brittles just to give it a, a different type of flavor. Your caramels, um, typically it has an interfering substance like cream and corn syrup um, to prevent that crystallization. And then taffy contains simple uh, sucrose syrups that uh, is a substance that inverts the sugar and prevents that crystallization. So after cooking, the syrup is cooked until you can handle it and then you're actually able to pull it apart. Um, so, you know, if you've been to some places where you've seen them make uh, taffy before, um, they have machines and things like that. They'll actually do the pulling for them or they might have somebody kind of demonstrating that for you um, in a window so that you can see that process happening with um, taffy. Now, there are some uh, tips and tricks to this. So like grandma taught me, <laughs> okay? So candy is very finicky. So it's important that when you make candy that it's on a day that is nice outside, um, it's dry, there's low humidity because if it's raining or if there's high humidity, your candy is not gonna set properly. So that's kind of where the water uh, comes in. So uh, just kind of be mindful of that as well. Um, us being in, or me being in Tennessee, uh, you know, the summertime in the South is not the ideal time to be making candy. Um, so that's why you see a lot of it being made uh, during the winter months um, because it, there is low humidity and it is dry outside. Um, also making sure that you use a candy thermometer. So there are many types of thermometers out there, but it's important to have one that is for candy making. It may also have uh, frying temperatures on there as well, and that is perfectly fine. So you might see it as a uh, deep fryer and or candy thermometer as well. And so I've, I've put a couple of pictures up here of the different types uh, of candy thermometers that you might see out there as well. It's very important that you calibrate your candy thermometer before use to make sure it's working properly. And to do that, here's a, um, we're actually going to show a short video here in a moment of how to do that. Um, but you want to bring your uh, pot to a boiling and then place your thermometer into that boiling water and let it get to a steady temperature. Um, so the closer you are to sea level, that boiling point is going to be 212 degrees. And as you increase in elevation or altitude, that boiling point will decrease and you're going to have to adjust your temperature accordingly. Now, um, a thermometer is a handy tool to have when making candy, but you can also use um, a cold water test to make sure um, you got the correct consistency for candy. And Explorium um, website here, and that will be shared with you um, after this after um, this presentation in the follow up email. But it does have some good. Um, videos on here that shows you the different uh, stages of candy. You can use that as well as a way to determine um, if you're at the proper temperature to add certain ingredients at certain times. Um, so this is a good little website to, um, to go to. So that will be shared with you all as, as well. So the other thing is um, the solution is super hot. So use caution when you're actually working with the mixture and be careful adding in ingredients throughout the process because it could release a burst of steam and it can burn you. So um, that is a possibility. So when you are adding ingredients into your pot, just make sure that you're kind of standing back as you do that because th that burst of steam could come out and it can actually burn you as well. So in this video, um, it's going to show you how to um, calibrate a thermometer, candy thermometer. And um, if y'all can't hear it, just let me know. 
and I'll uh, go to a YouTube video to show you all. Hi everyone, this is Elizabeth Brent from the Family Consumer Science Extension Agent for UT Extension in Washington County. I'm here today to talk to you all about how to calibrate a candy thermometer for candy making. So you might have something that looks very similar um, to this here. Uh, it may say on there, This is the one that we are going to be uh, using today to show you how to calibrate a candy thermometer here. And you are going to see uh, the different stages, the ball stages, whether it's a hard ball, um, a soft ball, just based off of the temperatures here. Um, and then the good thing about this one, it is, does have a clip on it um, so that it does clip on the back of the um, pan that you are using to make your candy. Um, and then down here is the little bulb that is going to be um, inside the pan as well. And you'll see a little lip here and that is to prevent um, this part here from actually touching the bottom, the heating element um, in on your stove. We have our candy thermometer here um, in our pan. And so we're just waiting for the water to boil. Um, you can see on the back that it is clipped to the side of the pan. Um, it is also not touching the bottom of the pan, um, but it is within, it's submerged in the water, um, that bulb is. And so what we're looking for is we're waiting for um, the blue line inside of there. I don't know if you can see it, um, but we need to get it, there it goes, uh, to that 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is boiling. Um, but since I am at a little bit higher elevation, uh, the boiling point around here is anywhere from 210 to 211. So the higher the elevation that you go, the lower the boiling point will be. And so you will need to adjust your um, recipe based off of that and the degrees that it needs to go to. Now our water is beginning to boil, um, but we are not quite there to that 212 degrees or that 210, so we've got to wait till our water is at a full rolling boil um, to make sure that we have an accurate measurement for it. thermometer is rising. Um, we're not quite there yet because we are not at a full rolling boil. Um, we have to make sure that our water is a full rolling boil um, to make sure that we have reached that 212 degrees or 210 to 11, um, whatever the boiling point is within your area. Of course, as you get higher in elevation, that's going to affect it. That boiling point is going to decrease. Um, so where I am right now, the boiling point is about 210 to 11 in this area. So I'm waiting for this water to get to a full rolling boil before I take that measurement to make sure that my thermometer is calibrated correctly. Now our water is at a full rolling boil here. And this is a good time to check your thermometer, make sure that it has stopped rising. Okay, so um, we're finding that, and it looks it's hard, sorry, um, the steam is coming off, but um, looking at it, um, it looks like we're around. Um, this one is reading about 206, 207. Um, so basically what that means is that we need to adjust our recipe um, for that temperature. So for example, if our recipe calls for us to get to 220 degrees, we really need to try to get to 213 degrees um, to be at the proper uh, temperature that we need to for that specific recipe. Um, so we're just kind of making sure that it's holding steady there. Um, and so this is why you want to calibrate your thermometers, uh, just to make sure that you're at the temperature that you need to be at um, for things like this. So um, it's always good to go ahead and just calibrate them. Um, and so also with your thermometers, just make sure that you store them in a place um, that's not gonna jumble them around everywhere. Um, that bulb is very sensitive. Um, 
the thermometer casing is made of glass so you don't want that to break so just make sure that you put it in a safe place that it's not just going to get jumbled around um, so that it does not break uh, your thermometer so we're just going to go back and show that to you again just that temperature um, so yeah we're right around that 206 207 mark um, so we will adjust our recipe for that Okay, so um, Hi, sorry. Um, so the thermometer, and I just have to bring this uh, to your attention. So that thermometer was actually a brand new thermometer. So I just got it out of the packaging um, and was calibrating it. And so you can see that it can still read off. And so it's important that even if it's a new um, thermometer, what it, whichever one that you uh, like to use, that uh, you actually calibrate it before using it as well. Um, and then if it's more of a cold uh, type of environment for that thermometer, so like, for example, I know we're going a little bit off topic, but like for a re refrigerator or freezer, you would actually stick that type of thermometer down in ice cold water to see if you're reaching um, that temperature that you need to. So getting back to our uh, candy making, so there are some don'ts uh, with candy making. Um, so don't cook the sugar mixture too fast. Um, so bring it to a boil, which means actually cooking it on medium heat and not high heat. So I know a lot of us get in a hurry and we want to get it done and we want to get it done quickly. But it's very important that um, you let it build the heat that it needs to. So it's important. A lot of recipes, you're going to see them being cooked on uh, medium heat. Um, so it's important that you do follow that as well. Also, it's important not to use uh, metal utensils uh, because metal does conduct heat really well. So it's best to use um, like wooden spoons. Um, if metal spoons is all that you have, just make sure that you're using an oven mitt or something like that when you're um, stirring just to make sure that you don't burn yourself. Um, also, no substitution. So just like baking, candy is a science and you need to go by the recipe to make sure that it comes out correctly. So that also means not doubling or tripling your bat uh, batching your candy. Um, so you do have to make one batch at a time. And I, I see some smiles. <laughs> Um, I know we want to make, you know, big batches and things like that. But when you're making things at home, um, it's important to um, make sure that you uh, just kind of stick to that one batch at a time as well. Also, um, resist the urge of scraping the sides of the pan when you're dumping the candy on onto um, that cookie sheet or whatever other pan that you're um, dumping it into. So this actually helps prevent um, the crystallization of that sugar as well. Um, now, I know I've seen a lot of people here from Idaho and Montana and Colorado and, you know, y'all are at much higher elevations than I am right now, um, New Mexico as well. So I see that um, there are specific uh, recommendations for those that are making candy at a higher elevation. And so Colorado State Extension has a really good publication on um you know, how to make candy at higher elevations as well. So I'll show you that website real quick. Um, so this website will be shared with you as well um, in that follow-up email about what you're looking for um, if you are making that um, candy at uh, higher elevations um, and where it kind of should fall at as well. All right. So um, some things to think about is, um, you know, you have grainy uh, candy and it's like, what did I do wrong? How did this happen? So when this happens, there's something called seeding um, and that's where the sugar crystals uh, find their way um, into the candy solution as it cools. So um, seeding is where crystals that have not been dissolved in the solution begin to make their way up the sides of the pan or onto your cooking utensils. And they may actually drop into the pan causing that uh, crystallization to prematurely happen as well. So the grainy texture can apply to both uh, crystalline type of candy such as fudge and divinity and fondant. Um, and then non-crystalline candy, such as taffy, caramel, and brittle, it can happen with them as well. So it can go both ways, um, depending on how bad that seeding is, is happening. 
So some tips to help you all if this is happening. Um, if there is butter called for in that recipe, be sure to use unsalted butter when you do this and actually grease the sides of the pan. So if they are trying to move up the sides of the pan, they kind of fall down um, and they're not making their way up. Um, bring that liquid to a boil and then remove your pan from the heat and then add in your sugar if that's uh, way the way the recipe calls for it. Um, you can cover the pan with a lid and the heat mixture to a boil and just kind of let it steam and that steam helps um, the the seeding, preventing the seeding from happening. Um, and the other option as well is um, you can wrap a fork with a wet paper towel and wipe the sides of the pan where the crystals are forming. So you're not actually like getting that fork down into the solution or into your mixture, but you're just kind of wiping those sides of the pan um, if you're starting to see that happening as well. All right, so getting into um, making our peanut brittle. So um, you all will receive the recipe that I used um, while doing this video. So you do need to uh, two cups of sugar, so granulated sugar, one cup of light corn syrup, a half a cup of water, a cup of peanuts, a quarter teaspoon of salt, uh, two teaspoons of baking soda, and then a teaspoon of butter as well are um, the ingredients that you'd need to make this specific peanut brittle. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and get this started. This is Elizabeth Renfro, uh, Family and Consumer Science Extension Agent with UTTSU Extension, Washington County. And I am here today to show you all how to make peanut brittle. Um, so one of the big things, of course, is making sure that you have a candy thermometer. So I showed that in a previous video, um, how to calibrate your candy thermometers. Um, so this is what we're gonna be using today. Um, we also need uh, two cups of sugar, we need uh, one cup of light corn syrup, as well as half a cup of water, one cup of peanuts, um, a quarter teaspoon of salt, two teaspoons of baking soda, and one teaspoon of butter. Now, one of the first things that you want to do is to cover a cookie sheet, a large one, with um, parchment paper or wax paper, and make sure that you grease it down really well. Today I used cooking spray to grease it down really well so that when we break it up, it will slide off more easily um, off of the paper. Okay, so I have measured out my sugar, my light corn syrup, and then also my water. And so I am going to um, turn my heat on medium heat. Um, you don't wanna cook this uh, too quickly or on too high um, of an eye. So we're just going to mix this together on that medium heat um, and then here I'm just going to get it nice, nicely mixed up real quick uh, and then I'm going to put my um, candy whip thermometer down in there because I have to reach uh, a temperature of 220 degrees. However, when I calibrated my candy thermometer um, earlier, I just noticed that it was getting to about 206. 207 so the temperature that I need to get to here uh, is at 213 degrees I have to compensate for um, it not actually reaching that boiling point um, so you can go back and watch that video about how to calibrate your candy thermometers uh, when that happens okay so when you make candy you want to make sure that you have a pot that has a flat bottom and tall sides um, and then on these candy thermometers, uh, so that it slides up and down uh, this little clip here. So we're gonna clip that onto the side. We're gonna try to get it as far down as we can. Okay. Um, and so when it starts boiling, of course, it'll hit um, the bowl down at the bottom. So we're just gonna sit here and stir uh, until we get what we need. Don't worry, I specifically sped up this part. 
So our thermometer is slowly rising here, but you can see that the solution kind of uh, is getting a little bit clearer uh, than what it was, less cloudy, I should say. Um, but we're still trying to get to that 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you don't want to speed this up um, and you want to be stirring constantly to prevent um, that sugar from burning on the bottom. So you got to keep keep stirring. Also make sure that you're not using uh, metal utensils when you do this because the solutions get really hot and metal is a really good conductor. So um, it might burn your hands. So make sure that you use something um, that's not going to, you know, conduct that heat as well as metal. Uh, if that's all you have, then make sure that you have a pot holder. Um, hold when you're holding the metal utensil and stirring um, can be very helpful as well. Now you can see as I'm stirring that there is bubbles down at the bottom. Um, so this is kind of what you're looking for. Uh, and you can see that thermometer is slowly um, gaining a little traction in that heat. Um, so the recipe calls for this to get to 220 degrees before we add the peanuts and the salt. Um, but after, like I said, I calibrated this one, it was about 206, 207. So I want to reach that 213 degrees, um, 214 uh, before, or, yeah, 213, 214 before adding the salt or the peanuts uh, into this solution here. Okay, so our thermometer is reading about 213, 214 right now. Um, so this is the time, uh, of course, based off of the calibration of your thermometer. Um, so if, you know, if your thermometer was, when you calibrate it, was reading 212, of course, you get to 220. Um, but we're going to go ahead and add our quarter teaspoon of salt here. And then we're going to add our one cup of peanut. Okay. And then we're going to continue to stir and we're going to continue to stir this until we reach 290 degrees that's what the recipe said um, so we're trying to get to that 283 284 um, somewhere around there uh, to make sure that we um, get to that proper temperature so we just keep stirring until we get to that temperature so at this point you might see the sugar solution starting to caramelize, so that nice golden brown color that you look for in a peanut brittle, but our thermometer is still rising, so we still need to get to that um, 284-285 point um, for this particular thermometer um, to make sure that we've reached that proper stage so that we get that nice um, peanut brittle. Now the next stage and the next stage, once we reach that temperature, we are going to be adding a teaspoon of butter and tea, two, tea, two, we will be adding a teaspoon of butter and two teaspoons of baking soda into our solution. I wanted to give you all a closer up view of what it looks like so far. You can kind of see there is that um, golden tint to it. Um, so that is the sugar caramelizing. Our thermometer is still uh, building up um, temperature, so we're not quite there to add our butter and our baking soda into this. So we just keep stirring. So you can see the consistency has changed a little bit. It's gotten a little bit more golden brown. Um, you can really start smelling the peanuts, um, their fragrance coming out. Uh, but we're almost there to the temperature that we need to be at um, to add our butter and our baking soda. So we're just going to keep stirring um, until we get to that point and then I will show you the process of adding the butter and the baking soda. Alright, so we're at the temperature where we need to be at, at 284 to 285 here in this area. So I'm going to go ahead and take my candy thermometer out and set it aside. I'm going to take this off the heat here and then I'm going to add my butter, um, get that mixed up really good. And then um, once I got that in there, I'm going to add 
the baking soda. And this is what gives it, helps create that carbon dioxide in there and gives you that nice fluffy uh, look that you're wanting. So you can see that it starts growing. It's getting bigger. Um, it's changing colors. Let me turn off the here. Okay, so once we got that mixed up, then we're going to move over here and we're going to pour it in our pan, our cookie sheet that we prepared. get as much as we can out of it just to the side and then we're just going to kind of spread it out a little bit I mean it's getting as thin as we can and then we're going to let it sit here um, until it's completely cooled and then we'll come back and we'll break it up now, after your peanut brittle has cooled down, this is um, what it's going to look like. It's going to slide around a little bit, um, but I'm going to show you here really quick how to break it up. Now, when you're ready to break up your peanut brittle, you just want to have, you can have a meat cleaver, you can have a hammer. Um, just make sure that you cover it with um, some kind of wrap, whether it's a sandwich bag or this plastic wrap here. Um, this thing here went to some kind of grill cleaner thing, so it doesn't have the scrubber on it, but it's pretty heavy. And you just sit here and you just bang it. Um, to break up your different pieces. So you wind up with um, your pieces of peanut brittle. And that's what it looks like. on to the hold on <laughs> so um you saw on the and one of the things to remember as well is um when you do make brittle um when I taught this class in person to people they were surprised when I brought out a hammer um to break up the peanut brittle because they didn't know that's how you broke up um, brittle and so yes you do need um a hammer or a meat cleaver or something that's heavy to be able to break up um, that peanut brittle as well. Um, but you saw like the peanut brittle, it was that nice shiny um, kind of coating on the outside of it as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I did attempt it and I did scrape a little bit of the pan as well to get most of that out. But I also noticed that there wasn't a lot of uh, seating on the side of the pan. Um, so you might also be thinking, I know this is like a 10 minute video, but how long did it actually take? It takes, it, depending on the day um, and what the temperature is like outside and the humidity, it can, it can vary. Um, it can be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, depending on kind of where you're at um, on that location. So for me, it took probably about 45 minutes. Um, to actually make the peanut brittle and then I let it set for a few hours um, before I actually broke it up. Um, so you do need to make sure that it is um, uh, like set pretty hard before you try um, to break it up as well. Um, so I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions about like um, using different types of things. And so I'm gonna see if I can find some recipes for you all. Um, you know, trying to use different sugars, uh, maybe not using um, corn syrup and things like that. It's important that you find those recipes that have the specific ingredients um, and tells you exactly how much of everything that you need to put in there. Because like I said earlier, it is a science when it comes to candy making. It's a lot of fun to do. 
um, but there is a science behind it. And so you have to make sure that you have the proper amount of ingredients or um, your, your candy is not going to set or you're going to have that really grainy candy um, as well. So I'll, I'll look for those recipes for you all and I'll share them with Serene. And so she can get those out to you all um, in that follow up email that she sends everybody um, after this uh, class.